it should start recording. Right, lecture beginning. Jolly good. Let's go over to this. Okay, so brief lecture on electronic conspicuity. I'm going to try and rattle along. There's quite a few slides to get through. But the basic idea is just to look at some electronic conspicuity technologies and to explain how they work, why they work, who they're for, and why they're not all compatible. Because everybody's moaning on the paragliding various groups and forums that why aren't all these technologies compatible? And you say, well, you know, there is no compatible technology for somebody who wants to drive 250 miles in a car compared to somebody who wants to cycle 100, yeah, 150 yards on a manually pedal bike. They're different technologies, different jobs. They won't ever all be together. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, a number of the technologies, see how they work and see how it all just bolts together or doesn't. So a bit of housekeeping. My name's Steve. I've been hang gliding since, and paragliding since 1989. Um, now I've branched out a bit. That's me on a hang glider, my old paraglider that some people might remember. That's me on, um, that was my first three axis aircraft, which a lot of the micro light people call uncomplimentary, in an uncomplimentary fashion, the old shitter, because it's an old two stroke on a fuse tube design. That's a very basic three axis micro light. And then over there, that's me on my quantum, which is what mo most people acknowledge is a micro light, because actually it looks like. Um, it looks like a, a flex wing and when people say when people say micro light they actually mean flex wing micro light so right um so audio for the edit so if anybody asks the question i'll probably repeat the question that way we've got the question hopefully on this mic and obviously if the recording goes wrong everybody will say the broadcast engineer is an idiot but then that's so the first half of this is going to be purely about the philosophy electro of electronic conspicuity because we can dive into all the technology and it's all just all technology. You know, if somebody's telling you about Allen keys or spanners, unless you've seen that the spanner is there to undo a bolt or a nut, you think, well, what is this strange shaped object? How does it work? But if somebody had said to you, you know, we bolted this together very, really tight and now you can't get it off with your hands, this magic device does this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the philosophy first why are we doing it? Who are we doing it for? Then when we come to look at the technology, we'll understand why the technology works like it does. Why, for instance, live tracking is brilliant for paraglider pilots and for airline pilots, it's completely and totally useless and worthless. So, um, right, let's look at the beginning of the philosophy, which is to do with being conspicuous. So to be conspicuous is to be uh, clearly visible to attract attention, which obviously you want to do if you want people to avoid you. And conspicuity is the property of being clearly discernible and the state or quality of being clear or bright, brightness, conspicuousness. So that's fairly straightforward. So the fact that somebody finds it easy to see you does not necessarily make it easy for you to see them. And the problem with real life is that we're used to the fact that if I can see you, you can usually see me. If I can hear you, you can usually see. It's a reciprocal thing, but it's not. So just to run very quickly through, you can see here two cyclists. They've done the responsible thing. You're driving along in your car on main beam. The reflective jackets make them ultra conspicuous. You know, if you'd see these guys from maybe half a mile away, and then you'd already have them in your thing, you'd be conscious of avoiding them. And the last thing you want to do is hit them or run them over. However, if you were driving along that road um, in a black car, the only reason they would see you coming is because they can see your headlights. And in terms of them finding it easier to be seen, it doesn't make it easier for them to see anything. If it's as black as night and they're riding along with high-vis jackets but they've got no lights, their conspicuity doesn't make things more conspicuous to them. So we're trying to see, we want to look at the whole reciprocal thing. And we need to understand this when we talk about paragliders flying with flam. So just because they can be seen more easily doesn't make them see anything any better. You know, the cyclist view of the cars is exactly the same as it was if they weren't wearing high vis jackets. As they are slow and vulnerable, it makes sense to, for them to make themselves obvious to people who are fast moving who will then take more responsibility for avoiding them. So let's look again at that conspicu co concept of conspicuity being reciprocal. If you look at this guy, what does the red light help him see? 
Nothing, is the answer. I would see him because he's got the red light on. At the other end of the bike, he will see things because he's got an ultra bright yellow light on his bike. So again, it's a question of electronic, con well, conspicuity generally is not automatically a two way street. So again, cyclists, again, good example. We can see them because of the white lights they're carrying and they can see where they're going because of the white lights they're carrying. This is bi-directional conspicuity and it's the best sort of conspicuity. Right, so we've now spoken about conspicuity, but now why are we doing this? You know, that's an important question. So the answers are very, very different for different sorts of aircraft and different sorts of pilot. We're going to talk in more detail about this, but let's look at a clear example. So electronic, one form of electronic conspicuity that we've used for years is live tracking. Why are we do, you carrying live tracking? So we're carrying live tracking because we want the competition organisers to know that we're safe. And when we land, we want them to come along and retrieve us in no time at all. And live tracking has revolutionised retrieves. You've been on a competition in the last 10 years driven by live tracking. You'll know how good it is. Um, being retrieved is completely different from two sailplanes blatting along a cloud street 50 foot from cloud base not being able to see each other through the dips and having something come up and say there's somebody 3k ahead who's going to hit you in a minute and in um, a minute and a half so different requirements paragliders wouldn't use electronic conspicuity to see other paragliders because we're often very close and if you need to look at a screen or hear something to be told he's about to kill you it's too late but it's different with sailplanes because you could have two sailplanes closing on each other under a cloud street at a, a, they could easily be doing, each be doing 120 kilometers an hour. That's a combined closing speed of 240 kilometers an hour. That's four kilometers a minute. So at the point where they are four kilometers away from each other, they're a minute from a crash. One kilometer away, 15 seconds from a crash. So very, very different reasons, very, very different reasons for doing things. And also that's tied into what do we want from it? So sailplanes flam they just want to avoid each other they're not that bothered about the retrieve because they tend not to land out on the other hand if we look at our forms of electronic conspicuity indy has written an app called xc guide i assume most of you have used it the electronic conspicuity embedded in xc guide is about knowing where everybody is when you're guiding in a group being able to keep tabs on your friends see other pilots and so on and so forth so there we've seen already huge differences in the philosophy of why we might want some form of electronic conspicuity so we're going to develop this philosophy a little bit and we're going to look at just the different forms we're not looking at the technology but we're going to just look at some names and some tech some ideas so you may have heard general aviation and commercial air commercial pilots talk about transponders and adsb so the Transponders and ADS-B are very, very different to gliding and paragliding. Transponders particularly don't show the person carrying the transponder anything, but they show that aircraft to ATC. So the safety from electronic conspicuity given by a transponder is because somebody in ATC can tell you what to do. So the relationship between GA pilots carrying transponders and ATC is very, very much one of an adult and a child. The adult wants to know where the child is. They don't want the child to run across the road and the adult tells the child what to do. That's never going to work for sailplane pilots in thermals. You can't have somebody watching you say, oh no, you, you need to, it would never work. You get 10 people in a gaggle and the person trying to tell them all what to do on a radio has lost the plot. So there we're looking at fast move, with, with transponders and ADSB, we're looking at the need to manage controlled airspace, to have one point of management, who's in charge and we're also looking at fast moving aircraft in ordered patterns so i'd already spoken about um what's about um flam and there's a technology called tcas so because transponders don't show you anything you might like to have an, another system on your commercial airliner um, that keeps an eye out and then pings other transponders and then can build you a real-time picture of where everybody is and uh, TCAS is short for Traffic Collision Avoidance System. So 
it's something that goes on top of the transponder technology that when those commercial aircraft are out and about and not maybe under precise ATC control, it stops them colliding. FLAM is flight alarm. Sailplane pilots use that. It was developed for sailplanes and it's only interested in collision avoidance. It's not even designed for live tracking, which is why when people moan about their little FLAM thing on their um, sky tracks, oh, it doesn't go very far. It doesn't need to go very far. The whole idea of FLAM is collision avoidance. If it tells you about the people who are trying to kill you within 10k, that's enough. Nobody can kill you from 50 or 60k away in a collision. And that's why FLAM is actually quite short distance. So, um, what else do we want? Another reason why we might be doing this, we've already looked at with hang gliders and paragliders, because we're not going to need the EC to tell us to avoid each other. But if we're flying in a competition, when we land out, we want to be recovered quickly by the retrieve. The other thing that a lot of the modern systems do, and Brett's system does this, is that if a, hang, if a paraglider descends at more than five metres a second for more than a set period of time, an alarm goes off in competition HQ to say this person is falling out the sky. And obviously, because you've got real-time tracking, you can tell when that person impacts the ground. If they descend from, say, 3,000 metres to 1,000 metres and then it stops, you breathe a sigh of relief and they then fly away at one metre a second descent rate. You forget it happened. If, on the other hand, they arrive on terra firma at five metres a second, you're sending somebody to go and get them. So, you know, we've spoken about all this stuff. Now think about people, airliners, helicopters and drones. What would a drone want from, ele from electronic conspicuity? They don't often get lost, but you might want to know the last position of your drone before it disappeared from sight or went into the water. But more to the point, as a drone pilot, you might want electronic conspicuity to flag your presence to GA and commercial air transport so you can fly in airspace at the moment you're banned from. So you can see there's all these things of coming, electronic conspiracy, I want to be retrieved, I want to be able to get straight out of an airport and land at another airport without circling, I want to be able to see other gliders and not crash into them at cloud base. So you can see all these conflicting needs and they're never going to be met by one system. So the other question we also need to ask ourselves when we start carrying electronic conspiracy, well there's two questions, who is most likely to kill or injure me if they don't see me? And who am I most likely to kill or injure if I don't see them? Now, for us, the first question is more relevant because I think our biggest risk comes from GA, light aircraft, outside controlled airspace. We're not allowed into controlled airspace. We are not going to be trying to dodge around airliners near Heathrow. So straight away, we can rule out certain procedures and certain types of electronic conspicuity. But we are likely to have... Collisions with GA, and because GA pilots tend to fly VFR, most people don't understand that above 3,000 foot, VFR stops you going within 1,000 foot of cloud base. So over 3,000 foot, within that last 1,000 foot before cloud, the people you're most likely to collide with are sailplanes, because they would fly there under visual conditions but technically you know and people say this this is another thing that a lot of people are confused about the minute you're you're at cloud base over three grand anywhere in the uk you are not under vfr you're under ifr you know because you are in imc because you're within that thousand foot cloud or 1500 meters horizontally again over three thousand foot you're ifr but oh, we're not allowed to fly IFR. well we are because there's nothing to stop us you know so and let's hope that it stays that way Right, so let's talk very quickly about some of the devices. Um, there's a number of ways of approaching electronic conspicuity for us. And what we tend to do is we do one of two things. So one way, if you want it to be ultra simple and you just want sailplane pilots to avoid you, you carry a flam beacon. And there's a thing called um, a Skytrax beacon. They were under 200 quid. Fantastic value for money. Unfortunately, Skytrax have stopped making them. Um, you can now get, there's, uh, does anybody here know Indy? Indy's the writer of XC Guide. So he's been experimenting with a lot of home-built stuff. And you can build yourself a Flam Beacon for somewhere between 32 and 60 quid. So that's one way of doing it. So you could build yourself a little Flam Beacon and then that Flam Beacon, providing it's got the right protocols, will talk to XC Guide, which is Indy's app, or XC Track and so on and so forth. 
The other um, the other instruments are things like XC Tracers, the Flam and the Max, the Navita Blade, UD5. Uh, the UDN, unfortunately, hasn't got as far as getting um, any electronic conspicuity. And when I spoke to the Max saint September last year, they just pulled a bad face and said, no, we can't get the bits at the moment. And then there is the Skytrax stuff, Skytrax 2.1, Skytrax 3. I mean, there's other stuff. That list not exhaustive. There's probably more other. There's the um, Flymaster DS now. But the main point is that there's Flam only. There's Fanit. And then there's Fanit Plus, which is Flam Transmission and Fanit. And when we get into the second part, we will um, we'll look at that. So that's actually the end of the first part. So I'm just going to make that go black and then i will start the next um part of the lecture and then there'll be a break in that because at that point you will start to get rather bored of me right right so now we've talked about the philosophy so we understand about the fact that i can see you doesn't mean you can see me we talked about bi-direction and we talked about the things that people want, why we might do it, who we might do it for. So now we're going to run, just run through again and go into the technology and look at it more from a purely technical standpoint. So what do we want from electronic conspicuity? We want to be seen by other aircraft. We want to see in the, in the case of Flam, Flam will actually allow you to if you've got a full flam piece of kit it will allow you to see other aircraft and see hazards because if you fly in europe with a in a glider with a full flam database all the power lines are on it what else can you do? in theory what, what might else you want if you have electronic conspicuity in a light aircraft and you can be seen by air traffic control you can call them up and fly through controlled airspace if they say so so that's another reason to do it access to controlled airspace if we come now more into paragliding and hang gliding, we might actually want to log our flights in competition or XC League without having to queue or download anything. And if you've been on a recent competition, you go back to base with the tracker and whoever's doing the check-in will say yeah, pilot number, tracker, thanks. Well, there's no need to download your tracker because we've managed to track you from the tracker and there's a complete track log and you have scored so many points. Fantastic. Also, um, and we've touched on this that we might really want to have the comp organized dispatch emergency services in the event of an incident and although thankfully we haven't had that many incidents when we have had to use it it has helped i mean at least one person who landed safely and then i think collapsed with a heart attack or a stroke had the emergency services turn up and whisk them away and they were fine in the end so it's highly useful because even when people haven't crashed, you know, if they don't check in, you've got a number to call them on. If you call them on the number and they're unresponsive, but the phone rings, then there's a good answer for sending somebody out to see what's happened. Right. Um, also, to pick up on objective three, access to controlled airspace. One of the big problems about controlled airspace is that most air traffic controllers want to say, oh, yeah, OK, then, yes, um, permission to cross South End you know, not be, not a, um, not below 1,500 foot. Report this VRP, fly overhead, report that VRP. Now, we can't do that in a straight line. And if we're at 2,000 foot, we can't guarantee that in five miles' time we won't be on the deck. So a lot of the time, the access to controlled airspace doesn't help us, and we tend not to use electronic conspicuity for that. We tend to go with um, letters of agreement. So you're the sailplane people, because you're not supposed to fly above um, flight level 100, 10,000 foot without a transponder, and they're not all kitted out with transponders. They have letters of agreement for wave boxes over certain ranges of hills, where when that wave box is then activated, they can go to 15, 18,000 foot, and then ATC or whoever the flight, whoever controls that flight information region knows the box is open and to route airliners around it. So, um, EC is not always the answer for access to controlled airspace. All right. So, I think we've touched on um, 
the uh, emergency dispatch. So now we're going to now dive really in hard and we're going to look at a list of the technologies. So transponders tend to be used by commercial air transport. That's what CAT's short for. GA, short for general aviation and microlites. They have to be certified and that makes them expensive. So the, the next level, now it's important to mention with transponders, the big problem with transponders is that they are very, very old technology, conceptually, and unlike all the other technologies we're going to talk about, they by themselves don't transmit a location. So they have to have something else to work out the location. All the other things, so ADSB, which is a technology derived from transponders, that requires a GPS unit, and that GPS unit feeds your ADSB with a location. So at that point, that form of electronic conspicuity can tell everybody who receives the signal where you are. And it's the same for all the other technologies. So ADSB is, can, be cert, can be certified but on two levels. There's an international level, which is super expensive. And in the UK, there's a UK only level of ADSB, which is a lot cheaper, but unfortunately UK only. Uh, FLAM, flight alarm, that's sailplanes, tugs, some helicopters and hang gliders <coughs> and paragliders. It's not certified. This keeps the cost down. And it also means that any advances in the technology can be rolled out like that after a bit of beta testing. If you make something certified and you come up with a, a new cleverness to it or a big update or a development, it'll have to be recertified. So that kind of holds you back. And that's why when you go into light aircraft, you see so many engines from the 1950s and 1960s with that sort of technology that you just don't see now in cars. You don't see cars without electronic ignition now, do you? You will see a lot of older light aircraft with non-electronic ignition. And if the makers of the certified engine want to upgrade to electronic ignition, there's a lot of testing to be done. So it doesn't get done. Uh, pilot aware, that's GA, general aviation, microlights and drones. That's not certified. Fan it. Hang gliders and paragliders, not certified. Live tracking is a sort of a generic title, but really it's live tracking via mobile broadband or over mobile phones. Um, the OGN is very similar. That's the open glider network. That works on a, a mixture of things. You know, it picks up FLAM. It has its own protocol that you can build a little tracker with. The, the OGN station swap data about air about aircraft flying via um a, 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 net, a, a secure network so there's a mixture of technologies there and then there's airware in the uk which is actually a fanet system okay so for all these technologies to work for you to be conspicuous and for people to know where you are we need to answer the question where are you so what are the methods of sending out or working out the location of the nearby aircraft? So we're going to look at transponders first because we don't use them, but the CIA used to go on about them as if they were a cure for everything. Oh, if they carry a transponder, this, if they carry a transponder. Well, so transponders are very old technology and originally they originate from World War II and um, identification friend or foe, IFF. And they were basically used for anti-aircraft defences. It uses a concept called primary location, so primary surveillance, and it is a form of echolocation. So if you're familiar with how bats fly, you know, the bat sends out a squeak and then the bat shuts up and after a while the squeak bounces back off things. The bat's got two ears and it can work out from the... Um, from if it works out with its oh, what's the word I'm looking for things with two ears it can work out the direction and the delay tells it how far away so straight away we've got a vector haven't we it is this far away in that direction so the bat knows where the obstacle is not to hit so we do the same with um, a radar beam 
The radar beam pings. There's a short listening period. During that listening period, at that particular angle that the beam is at, if anything bounces back, the delay will tell us the distance. The angle of the beam is the bearing. So now you have a blip on your radar screen. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, now the problem is you need to decide what the blip is. Because if you scan radar too close to the sea and there are windmills out to sea, you've seen the arrays, each one of those windmills generates a blip. And so suddenly you've got this huge array of, oh, oh where are all these aircraft coming from? No, they're stationary. They can't be flying. Unless there's a thousand and one helicopters all hovering. So what primary surveillance radar needed was some technology on top of it. Transponders work on secondary surveillance radar. So what happens now is that as that radar beam sweeps, it gets the, the ping, the echo back, and the direction. When a transponder hears the ping, on another frequency it says, yes, hello mate, I've, I've heard your ping, and I am an aircraft, and I have this squawk code. So suddenly now, if you ping a windmill, a windmill can't reply with a squawk code. When you ping an aircraft with a transponder, it replies with a squawk code. So straight away, you can wipe out all the primary surveillance radar pings. And this is why, if you look on your airspace maps, can you see transponder mandatory zones rather uh, for the arrays just off the Kent coast? That's why. So at that point, you're not trying to decode an echo. You've actually had a reply back on a different frequency to say, I have this code, and that code is either a general code or a code that the air traffic controller has given you. So when the air traffic controller is looking at their screen, they can see all the aircraft, and they know that anything with 7,000 is nothing to do with them, and anything that's got a code they've handed out, they've got to deal with. That's basically how it works. But you've seen now, I haven't at any point mentioned the aircraft seeing each other, because they don't. So if the air traffic controller is on his own and he goes for a P, nobody is looking at all those aircraft telling them what to do. Hypothetical situation. And if they were going to go for a wee and they do at South End at half past five in the morning, they have to close the airspace for half an hour. But important thing about transponders is to get across this thing that it's not, it's like I said before, the transponder works with an ATC. The ATC is the parent and the aircraft is the child. The child will be told what to do. It's that simple. So um, it's a technology on its own. And it's a very old technology because when we look at all the other technologies, all of them require a GPS. And when they transmit their lo when they transmit their signal, there is always a location with it. So that's why transponders. You see now the problem with the old technology. They're pre GPS. Although there's a little bit of a fiddle, and we will discuss that in a bit. So we've got all these systems that we've discussed and the bad news is they're not in competition. They perform different tasks. Oh, that has fallen over. No, it hasn't, thankfully. Um, they perform different tasks. They serve different sectors of aviation and they have different priorities. And this is something I keep touching on. In the end, the transponder is there for the small light aircraft that wants to fly across airspace. The small light aircraft flying across airspace will never need a retrieve unless he crashes. On the other hand, we can't cross airspace and we would like a retrieve. And if somebody can see we've actually landed and they get a ping for us, they'll come and get us. So that's the important thing to explain about different priorities. This is why they're not compatible, because they're trying to do completely different things. You know, FLAM versus transponder is a very, very good case. Two sailplane pilots with two transponders would crash into each other. They don't see each other. Somebody in ATC would oh, wonder why those two are getting too close to each other. But again, they're not on the radio to that ATC. They can't be helped. Two sailplanes, when they get within 5k of each other on a collision course, the flam thing in the cockpit will become very interesting. And as they get closer and closer, it will get more and more and more frantic. 
And the most simple flam units just literally have a compass rose pointing about where the person who's trying to kill you is coming from. So you can see, you know, are they dead ahead? Are they there? Are they there? And then there'll be an above or below. And so the worst situation is zero degrees on your level. And then you know you've got to do something. So, you know, it's, it's that different priorities thing that makes a very, very big difference. And we need to think about that when we're saying, well, you know, Flam is great. Why can't airliners see Flam? Well, because Flam is an uncertified technology for use in uncontrolled airspace. And the airliners are getting from A to B as fast as they can. They can't have random people crossing their flight paths who they have to avoid. So now let's look at another aspect of the different systems, which is certified versus uncertified, you know, and how things work. So the big problem with certified is the cost, but those who certify would tell you that it's far more reliable. It's had thousands and thousands of hours of testing. You know, there's duplex um, ways of processing for certain key things and so on and so forth. On the other hand, there's a lot of cost to it. And if you come up with a brilliant idea today, it's not going to be <coughs> pushed out to all the units in the field via the internet in the next month, two months, three months. International acceptability is another big issue. So with a class one or class tran two transponder, when you've bought that and you've got your little piece of paper in your hand saying it's certified, it works anywhere in the world. You know, it's covered by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. There is a simple class one and class two for transponders. You know, you go out to Malaysia or Indonesia and you're flying in a bush plane with a transponder. The transponder makes sense to them. You know, when you start looking at things like FLAM, FLAM is international, but unfortunately in the US they have a different frequency for FLAM. In Europe, we have a different frequency flam to the Americans. And then there are various incarnations of flam, maybe that only want to use one frequency or the other. We've touched on the ability to make changes uh, used by commercial operators. So in terms of the UK, if you fly an aircraft, I think that's over 15,000 15, kilos or carries more than 30 people, it must have TCAS. So there's no negotiation in it. And TCAS, again, is an ICAO system. So you can see why um, the uncertified systems are never going to make any headway. Because there are laws that say you're a commercial operator, you've got a 40 thing in the aircraft, you will have a transponder, you will have TCAS. You know, the other thing is, is that once you get into certified aircraft, you have to have exemptions and a lot of paperwork to install an uncertified system. So you will never find FLAM or Pilot Aware on a commercial airliner. It's just not allowed. In certain areas of certificate of airworthiness aircraft, light aircraft, you can get, if the necessary paperwork is done, you can un install an uncertified system in a certified aircraft, but not as a primary system. So you can install Pilot Aware because it just warns you about other aircraft. You know, you can't, use that as a thing me to ho as an excuse to hoik out your transponder okay so the last thing i want to talk about is best endeavors versus guaranteed delivery so this is more for when people move into using the internet or mobile broadband or mobile phones for ec because most of the time something like safe sky it's spewing out its pings every so often there is no guarantee that those pings are received and there is no um, way unless you take time over it of measuring a thing called latency. It's also a bit like if any of you have done any network, the difference between TCP, IP and UDP. With UDP, you just spray the information about if you get it, great. If you've done any audio or video over IP, UDP is used for the sync pulse because we just need to spray the synchronization everywhere and everybody just needs to jump on it and read it, but we don't care if they can't see it. But with TCP IP, you're doing a point to point thing. And you, if I tell you something, I'm waiting for you to tell me it back. And if you don't tell me it back, you won't get the next stage. And after I haven't heard it back from maybe a certain time out, I said, did you get that packet? And can you acknowledge it if you did? So, there are all these sort of things going on and we have to then consider best endeavours, drop out how reliable it is. So 
looking at the next slide, if you are flying in a glider with FLAM, FLAM is a radio protocol, so it's like a, it travels at the speed of light. If, the FLA, if your FLAM is working to transmit and the glider you're going to collide with has the same FLAM and its receive is working, that information will arrive instantaneously. You know, it's the speed of light. Okay, it's not no time at all, but it's not within the human time span of reaction. As far as our lives are concerned, it's in the blink of an eye. If we start doing things over the internet, over a high speed network, it becomes variable. And if you have friends who are gamers, they'll rant on about bandwidth and low latency and um, ping and how quickly. And it's why if you're in a, um, a slow network, you can't play video games with your friends over that network. So we also need to think about the consequences of losing that signal or losing that... Um, communication conduit if you were flying in a competition and 10 seconds of live tracking was lost it wouldn't be a big deal would it because as soon as the thing pack picks up 10 seconds later you haven't gone 1500 miles you're flying a paraglider you're doing an average of 10 meters a second 10 seconds 100 meters that's not the difference between you being lost forever and you being found within 10 minutes if we look at that same 10 seconds for our um, glider pilots who are closing on each other at four kilometers a minute it's one kilometer every 15 seconds so if we lose 10 seconds of tracking by the time it comes back there's only five seconds until the noise is heard and the crunch and bits start falling out the sky so that's why flam as a radio protocol is excellent you would never do it over any internet type thing you couldn't quant guarantee the delays and if you had a drop out there'd be an accident and it's the same here. If we had 10 seconds of ADSB or SSR lost, so if you're an airliner and you're blasting across the sky at somewhere in the region of a thousand kilometers an hour, you can imagine 10 seconds is an enormous amount of time. I haven't got the figures in my head at the moment, but you cannot afford to have those sort of dropouts when it's mission critical or you're trying for collision avoidance. So to a certain extent, certain protocols at the moment aren't suitable for EC where we're trying to be situationally aware or avoid a collision. They're fine for live tracking because in, the, in that 10 seconds that the live tracking was lost does not mean you don't get picked up from the pub in an hour and a half's time when the retrieve bus comes past. But again, you can see now what I'm highlighting time and time again is that we've all got enormously different requirements. You know, we all go on an XC, we land out in a comp, we want the retrieve bus. The airline pilot is never asking for the retrieve bus. So, okay. So we're going to now look, go back and look at a little bit about transponders and their modes. So we talked about the transponder, be, you know, as in you get your primary signal, you get the ping on the screen and the transponder has heard you ping and it says, right, I'm going to reply and tell them something. So the oldest mode of transponder is what's called mode A. So when you ping the transponder, it replies with a code that's programmed into it. And that code is either 7000, which means I just want you generally to see me, or it's a specific code which says I'm in your ATC circle and you need to look out for me. Or there's two others. There's another one for uh, radio not working and there's another one for hijack. So if you've been hijacked and the hijackers aren't very bright, the first thing you would do is dive into the transponder and set. It's either 7600 or 7700, I think. And then that's straight away, all the screens, you saw the red, all of them will go. If you look on Flight Radar 24, as some of my friends spend way too much of their time doing, any aircraft that has got an emergency code set in their transponder pops up on the screen with a big red alert on it. So, um, so anyway, that's mode A. Mode A will reply with a squawk code when interrogated. Now, that's not very useful because you can then see the aircraft in two dimensions, but you can't see it in three. So there could be an issue where two aircraft are 10,000 foot apart passing like this, but it looks as though on a 2D screen they're going to smack into each other. So there was an upgrade to transponders where they were... Oh, to the technology where they were given a thing called mode c or charlie mode charlie 
So now when your transponder is pinged, it will reply with the squawk code and it replies with altitude information added to that four digit squawk code. And that will come from an, enc from an encoder in the aircraft. So it's only as good as the aircraft's altimeter. And unfortunately, they're all designed to work on 101 3.2. And so that in itself causes a little bit of problems. So then obviously they wanted transponders actually rather than just a squawk code, which you have to manually set and an altitude, which comes from uh, an altimeter. They wanted to be able to just identify the aircraft full stop. So then along comes mode S, which is where we are now. So when you have a mode S transponder, you go on to the, in the UK, you would go on to the uh, CAA website and look at GINFO. Anybody ever use GINFO? It's a fantastic resource. You can't go on to the DVLA type in the registration number. It tells you who owns it. But the CAA have a, a, a resource called G-INFO. G you go in there, you type in the registration number of the aircraft without the G-DASH on it, and it tells you how long it is to the MOT runs out what sort of aircraft it is, what engine it's got, what propeller it's got, who the owner is, and so on and so forth, and what certification regime it's under. So that also gives, when you look up that information, you also get a thing called an ICAO code, which is the International Civil Aviation Authority. That code you put into your transponder. Your transponder will then ping that code back when it's interrogated by secondary surveillance radar. And that then means that anybody in ATC can see that number and that identifies your aircraft straight away. So if I were to go blundering through Heathrow airspace with a transponder with the correct ICAO code set in it, and if they caught me and I didn't have the right one set in it, I'd be in so much trouble it wouldn't be worth being alive. They would straight away know that it was a Sky Ranger, it was a Microlite and it was registered to me. So even if they didn't manage to grab me by the throat, then they'd probably come and knock on the door the following day. With all this clever stuff, you've noticed the transponder still can't tell anybody where it is. So no secondary surveillance radar, <coughs> no location for the transponder. Transponder is still in chocolate teapot mode. Now, the latest thing with, with um, mode S, they've had an addition to that that allows you to feed it with a GPS and turn it into ADS-B. So now we have transponders that can tell people where they are. Right, um, an added thing with this is that because transponders are certified, if you use an uncertified GPS like your um, Garmin 76, you'd have to set a bit in the GPS to say, in the transponder to say, uh, my GPS isn't certified, I am secure, I'm a surveillance integrity level zero, and then all the certified equipment would ignore you. So, you know, there is, um, right. So transponders, quick summary, what do they give us? We're seen by air traffic control. If it's a mode S transponder, uh, we can see it with a bearing on pilot aware, but new software only. And any, if you've got, if we've got a transponder, any aircraft with TCAS can see us and know exactly where we are. So additionally, transponders can't see pilot aware, but tr pilot aware can see transponders. And there's a load of mass that goes on to get a location for the transponder. And if we haven't got loads of towers and access to that mass, we can't see the location of the transponder aircraft. Other problems are we're not seen by gliders. We don't see anything with a transponder. And we can only told about traffic if we're in receipt of a traffic service or a deconfliction service from ATC. So I was going to explain all this, but basically too long didn't read his chocolate teapot. Right. If you're a light aircraft, you might sometimes get zone transits, depending on the controller whim or workload. And with a transponder, you can fly through transponder mandatory zones. When you add TCAS, a traffic collision avoidance system into a transponder it actually turns into something useful because then it can with your transpond in conjunction with your transponder it can then interrogate other transponders 
which is great because then you know where all the other aircraft are. It's got two levels of threat. So there's an advisory level and an action level. So the, the advisory level just says, oh, this is over there, that's over there. There's an action level where it will actually tell you what to do in order to avoid a collision. And unfortunately, the only, there's one or two accidents involving TCAS and the vast majority of them involve pilots who ignored the TCAS when it told them to do something. And in the subsequent investigation, they found that had the TCAS instructions been followed, people would still be alive. Um, the reason it works so well is that it gives the orders and it coordinates with the other aircraft via TCAS to make sure they both get you know, non-contradictory instructions. Uh, it's internationally mandatory over a certain weight and passenger number. Right, that's transponders done. There's a lot of it, but and there's a lot of them about, but they're of really of no use to us. You just need to understand how they work. The next thing we sp spoke about was ADSB, Automatic Dependent Broadcast for Surveillance. <coughs> this is a UK only version made under a CIA piece of paper called CAP 1391. It's UK only. The great thing about ADSB as opposed to transponders is that it shows you to AD, other ADSB equipped aircraft. So you're seen by other Sky Echo 2s, you'll be seen by Pilot Aware. Anyone who's got an ADSB receiver can see you. And also, because you've got the reciprocal, you can see anybody with ADSB. This is about 500 quid. It will talk to. Sky Demon or any flight bag on a mobile phone. So if you've got this, you've set it up. It's only got one control on it once you've set it up via Wi-Fi. You put it in the aircraft, you turn it on, you connect to it with your phone and you see all the other ADSB aircraft around and they see you. So that's very useful it, because it transmits its location and you don't really need to be certified to receive ADSB only to transmit it. It's actually very easy for other technologies to receive that and display it. So, um, Sky Echo 2 is ADSB in out and um, it's self contained. So, I don't think many paraglider pilots have got one, but I do know. Paraglider pilots who fly light aircraft, people like Jan in um, Sky Surfers, and Indy bought one. They've got them because you could carry this on a paraglider with some little twiddling and reconfiguration, and you can carry it in a light aircraft. And the great thing about this in a light aircraft is because it doesn't connect to the aircraft systems and no changes are made to the aircraft, this is a carry-on. There is no paperwork for it. When you go into certified aircraft land, you see people charging you £140 an hour to write out paperwork. You will understand why so many GA pilots have bought them. During the um, rebate, the last figures we had for about 18 months ago was that over 1,500 of those have been sold under rebate. And I reckon by the end of the rebate in three days' time, there'd be two and, between two and two and a half thousand of those been sold. Because once you've... <coughs> If, if you're in a syndicate on an aircraft, nobody wants to pay for anything. You buy one of those, you program it up, you just literally get in the aircraft, plonk it on the dash, and away you go. When you finish flying your aircraft, turn it off and take it home. All the other people who won't pay for a share of it don't benefit. You know, it's a bit like a flam beacon, and it's, it, it's, it's just very simple. The only problem is, is that it used to be able to see transponders, but without a location, but they turned that off in the software, which wasn't a lot of help. So let's have a break and then we'll <coughs> round up the rest of it because it is actually quite tedious and heavy going. It's fine. Jolly good. Okay. Okay, so um, we've done a lot of speaks about what people in light aircraft and airline pilots and all the other people want to do. And now we need to look at stuff closer to home. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how gliders fly. And that's why the whole ATC and organised patterns is not suitable because 
when we're gliding we need to constantly turn in thermals sailplanes particularly will fly fast under cloud streets close to cloud base we can't maintain altitude if required to fly in the wrong direction. You know, if you have to fly into the sea breeze, you'll sink like a stone. We need to be able to change direction the minute we see lift. So for all these reasons, transponder ATC methodology where you get told what to do is not really feasible. And we need real time instant anti-collision. So. I'm looking at this more from the glider pilot's point of view because the way things work with FLAM, we tend to have a FLAM transmit only so they can just see us and avoid us. So we're like the two cyclists with the high vis jackets. So now we're going to talk about FLAM, which is a, a proprietary crowdfunded anti collision system for sailplanes that started in 2003. And it was able to work in the uncertified world because there are some frequencies that are allocated for um, scientific and medical use. So FLAM uses a frequency dedicated for non-voice communications on 868 megahertz. The power and the amount of time you're allowed to transmit for is very, very, very small and quite strongly regulated. So, you know, one of the reasons that FLAM works so well in an instrument like the Air 3 or a Beacon is because it just pings once or twice a second for a very short period of time and at a very low power. And the reason it's very, very low power is because, as I've said, you, know, you can't collide with somebody 20k away. If you can see too many things, it distracts you. You only really want to see the people who are at risk of injuring you. So as you can see from this picture here, you've got a compass rose and it will show you above, below or dead ahead, all with angles. So somewhere around about there and somewhere around about there, you're going to be very worried. Now, it will be useful if Fanit did this or Pilot Aware did this, but it can't because unfortunately the Flam people have intellectual property on collision avoidance on a low power frequency and nobody really wants to test them. So um, what FLAM does is that it puts out a position and it also gives velocity information. So anybody receiving that information knows where that glider is and what direction it's headed in. In another FLAM equipped glider, you will know where you are and the direction you're headed in. And then some mass starts to worry about how likely you are to collide. And then depending on that, you'll get just a little, are you aware of this? Or oh, my God, you're going to die, change direction. That's the basic concept behind it. So great thing about it, because people moan about, well, if people are looking at things inside the cockpit and not outside, um, they're going to be more likely to collide because they're not looking. Now, the great thing about FLAM and Pilot Aware is that they will give you audible or verbal warnings. So a lot of people who fly with Pilot Aware, which is a similar system in light aircraft or microlights, some people are saying, well, you're looking at a screen, you're not. When I'm flying in my microlight with Pilot Aware, the Pilot Aware computer actually generates a human voice telling me where the nasty people are. This is more basic. It will just scream at you and, you know, and give you a visual indication. Some of the more expensive ones will, will tell you with a human voice that it's here or there or, you know, which helps. So the problem is, is that, so, sorry, unlike, trans, unlike transponders, it's about seeing, both being seen and seeing other people. So it's a two directional thing. You see me, I see you, we both take avoiding action. Um, Particularly in areas where there's a lot of flying close to cloud base, it's led to a demonstrable drop in mid-air collisions. And in fact, in the south of France, if you're flying a sailplane, it's not a legal requirement, but the French equivalent of the BGA, the British Gliding Association, whatever the French one is called, mandates that you fly with FLAM. So now where we come in is that FLAM is available as a low cost as transmit only for hang gliders and paragliders. So if you look at the 
licensing agreement for Flam on an Air 3 or a Skytrax Beacon or anything else, you will see that although they can't easily enforce it, you only have a license to use Flam on a hang glider or a paraglider. And except for the XC Tracer stuff, you can only use it to transmit. Most instruments that carry Flam, hang gliding and paragliding ones, you have to each update their firmware <coughs> once a year. Even if there is no changes to the firmware, you have to update because the Flam license never lasts more than a year. So, um, when we use Flam as part of Fanit, so, you know, Fanit Plus is Fanit in both directions plus a Flam transmit. It's only a transmit. So, except for certain XC Tracer devices, Kony has managed to do a deal where he can send and receive Flam, which is useful because then you can see sailplane activity. I know on the UD5, you can receive Flam, but you receive it via the OGN and there's quite a bit of latency because I had a little bit of flying with an UD5 a while back and I had the um, necessary addition in it so that I could Bluetooth it to my phone and then via the phone, you could then see gliders via the OGN. But they weren't very keen on it and... Um, Jürgen at Skytrax also has had the same facility on the Skytrax 3 and he actually in the end started trying to discourage people from using it because there was always going to be an issue with latency, you know, time delay and not only that, you couldn't quantify it. So if you could say to people, you'll see gliders but it'll be 0.1 of a second late or a second late, people would be warned but you couldn't tell what the delay was going to be. So that's Flam. Uh, Fanit is a very, very similar protocol to Flam. Uh, mostly worked on again by Jürgen at Skytrax. So he's the expert on it. The great thing about Fanit is that it wasn't made proprietary. So Jürgen and co worked on this thing and it's, it's out there in the open. It's an open protocol. The other thing about Fanit that Flam doesn't have, Flam is only anti-collision. So if people within 10k see you, they tick the box. Fanit allows you to see ground stations and it also allows you to do more than one hop. So Flam is, you're a glider, I'm a glider, we see each other. With Fanit, if you can see him and I can see you, but there's a big mountain in the way so I can't see him, I can see him electronically via you as a hop. So there's a lot more f uh, functionality in Fanit in that a, you can see gliders more than one hop away. And the second thing, and uh, what's his name? Does anybody know uh, Bernie? Bernie Hertz, who runs Burn Air. He sometimes does comp uh, works on competition. Oh, no, he used to do um, the fly further thing with um, Toby. So he's got a complete network of Fanit ground stations in Switzerland. So when you're flying in Switzerland with a Fanit equipped device, if it's set up properly, not only will you see other gliders and whether they're climbing or sinking, but you can see ground stations and wind directions. So the ground stations in the valleys, if there's a howling valley wind, they could be really helpful to you. Right, so that's sort of Flam for gliders and Fanit for us. Are there any questions about Fanit or Flam? Okay, right. So, um, well, look at what a lot of the micro light and light aircraft posse use. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is that we're talking about incompatible standards. But this standard for light aircraft actually involves a way that light aircraft will see flam equipped sailplanes or hang gliders and paragliders. And this is pilot aware. So Pilot Aware was launched in 2015 with its own frequency and ADSB in, and it's on the same frequency as Flam, so it's covered by this ISM. So as long as you're low power and you don't transmit too much, you can use it license-free, which is fantastic because as soon as you get into licenses and Ofcom, somebody is empty in your pockets. So. Where Pilot Aware started to interest us, because originally it had its own protocol and it could receive ADSB from Sky Echo 2 type things, where it started to interest us is that 
it's added the ability to see FLAM via what's called OGN rebroadcast. So the pilot aware people weren't happy with using OGN data because it was too late or too latent. They built their own network of ground stations. And what those ground stations do is they sniff all the FLAM units around, download that data, and then upload it all in the pilot aware protocol. So that suddenly means that all the pilot aware aircraft can now see gliders via the ground stations. So suddenly now, I'll give you an example. There's a ground station at Deanland. So does anybody know Frank Ogden? Okay, so Frank flies paragliders and he flies um, a Eurofox out of Kitty Hawk. If you're up at West Furl and you look out, you'll see an airstrip with a windsock and a huge solar farm. That's Kitty Hawk. So when Frank flies out of Kitty Hawk, with his pilot aware on his phone via the ground station at Deanland, he will see all of us who are flying on this ridge who've got any form of flam. And that will be downlinked by the ground station at Deanland and then sprayed out in pilot aware language. And in fact, I should have brought it with me and I'm now annoyed I haven't. Frank sent me a screen dump of him flying from Kitty Hawk, heading towards Eastbourne. And on the screen, he's got a large collection of people flying paragliders. In fact, I'll dig it out if I can afterwards, but we won't get too stuck in it there now. So the other thing it does is it converts some mode S from bearingless to bearing. That was 2018. So suddenly now a transponder with no location by doing some triangulation with all our ground stations, we can actually say we know where that transponder is. So suddenly now we can see another collection of aircraft. So, uh, oh, uh, sorry, so is that identify in any way um, when you say you know the boots on a furl? Would that sort of say who it was, or is it just a dot as such? No, it. You will get a dot and you will get probably an ICAO code with it. And I think maybe you get an identifier. Let me try and find the picture. But the main thing is, is that when, and again, not everybody uses Sky Demon. If you were using Indy's app and you were able to, you know, you'd got something going on there because i think indies app will talk to pilot aware if you're using indies app with pilot aware it will put its own symbol on because it's actually down to what the software wants to do so with sky demon sky demon is just told that there is this sort of aircraft at this location at this altitude if sky demon wants to put a father christmas on it that's sky demon so um so um this also uses an open protocol so now some of the OGN stations have now got a level of software that can see pilot aware. So now we're getting to the point where some of them, mostly the uncertified ones, are actually trying to talk to each other. So the, the problem is, as you've just asked, is that because it displays on a tablet running aviation software, that's one way, that's down to the software programmer. If you go and look at it on uh, 360 radar, or on plane finder it's all down to how they fiddle with that data because it is just ones and noughts and then the software writer decides what sort of pretty picture to put on it so again it, it displays on um your tablet what you can also do is at airfields where they've got the ground stations the ground station gives you a free feed with a radar display on it do you remember in the previous um earlier on in the, uh, the evening when I showed you that picture with all those things with call signs on them. That is a 360 radar display I get with my ground, because I built a pilot aware ground station for my own airstrip. And the reason for doing that was because there's an airfield at Chulloch about eight miles away and they're over a hill. So they've got a ground station, but we can't see them line of sight because unfortunately pilot aware is line of sight. If we have a ground station at Chulloch and a ground station at Edgerton on opposite sides of the hill, because all the pilot aware stations are actually on a secure network, it's over the internet, but it's like a VPN, no one else can see it. 
all the gliders at Cholock are told to my ground station, and my ground station then tells the ground station at Cholock about all the microlites. So when we're sat, when we're pushing it, before we push our planes out, you know, when we do our checks and we fill them up with fuel, we've got a little computer we switch on with a screen, and that shows us all the aerial activity for the area that pilot aware can deal with. So that's FLAM, that's ADSB, and that's pilot aware. So the great thing about it is that it's um I need to be on the next slide. Come on you. Let's go to the next one. So the great thing about it is that it gives spoken warnings to my intercom. So I'm not flying around looking for aircraft on a screen because I can't see them out the window. I fly around and it will see, you know, traffic noticed, two o'clock, five kilometers, 200 foot below. So then when I hear that, I'm a, oh yeah, I can see him. So that's why it's an enhanced situation awareness and safety thing. If we were looking on a screen for aircraft, we're not looking out the window. Whereas it's just like, flying with a decent audio vario you don't look at your vario do you? you can hear it start and then you're feeling for it same thing with this the rosetta tells me in a human sounding voice where the traffic is right so now let's have a, a little bit more of a look at fanit and this is stuff from um a skytrax 3 so FANIT stands for Flying Ad Hoc Networks, and that's what I was saying earlier on about the extra hops and the ground stations. It's actually an ad hoc network. So as you're flying, you and the other people with FANIT within your radio range are actually forming an ad hoc network. So I can see you, you can see him, therefore via you I see him. You get various displays. Again, it depends on the beast you're using. This is a, a Skytrack, so you can see there, they're paragliders. That's a hang glider. This is um, Slovenia, yeah. So the main market for Fanit Plus is hang gliders and paragliders. Most of them will have a bi-directional info on the Fanit frequency, and then there'll be a FLAM transmit. So anybody flying in this area with FLAM, I won't see. But if they've got proper full speed, full fat flam they will see me again it's on fan it is on that same ism frequency so same sort of um power same sort of distance again you know if you're flying in a group of people you really are only interested in being aware of people around you and people up to your gliding distance there's no good knowing that somebody 50k away is in a 10 up if somebody's 1500 meters away is in a 10 up and you can glide there and that's the great thing because sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on but here you can see green is a climb and blue is sink on sky tracks you know that it's not it's not going to be universally true so again covered this before we can only call it situational awareness as the pilot aware people do because collision avoidance is flam ip Right, so again, we talked about the labels. I don't actually have the label information. It depends on what instrument you've got, whether you would get. I mean, I think with the, um, when I flew with the UD5, for some reason it led me to believe that somebody was Greg Hamilton. And I was flying with it. And I got out the front of the dike and it wasn't that good a day. And I was looking at it. Oh, it's a shame you can't go cross country. And then I saw some people over near Ditchling. And that display on the UD told me that their climb rates were rubbish. And then the day died down. And I landed back at the dike. And I bumped into Greg, who had str indeed struggled to get back from Ditchling. He said, I got that far and it was just all shut down. And I came back. So it helps you with your cross-country decisions because you've seen, well, I know he's a much better pilot than I'm and he's much more current and he's got eight or nine K and now he's really struggling and he's coming back. So why would I then disappear off the back of the dike and then have to walk back from Jack and Jill? I don't think so. Right. So I touched on this as well. We can add in the weather stations. You know, a, there's a complete set of them in Switzerland. I know that, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the guy who was doing airware in this country. 
but I think his partner had a, I think they had a severe accident and then they, he had to convert the house for somebody disabled. So I don't think he was doing much on Airware, but Airware and all the funny stuff, there's a lot of functionality in it. And once you've got the ground stations, because it's an open protocol and no one's trying to make any money, you can actually buy the bits to build a bi-directional fanit thing very easily. You can buy the bits to build a fanit ground station very easily. Pilot Aware will give you the, the necessary Raspberry Pi stuff to build a free ground station, but they won't pay for the antennas. And by the time you've bought the antennas and paid for the right cable, it's about 250 quid. And the problem is people try and do it on the cheap and they use satellite cable and homemade antennas. And then the ground stations work very badly. And in fact, because I've got a login to be able to see all the pilot aware secure uh, stations via a secure network, I can see that mine and Indy's, Indy bought um, a factory built one. And Indy's pilot aware ground station can see aircraft the other side of the Isle of Wight. A, because it's properly built, and B, he lives up on the hill above um, Godston. So he's about 100 foot below the top of the hill. So visibility to the north over London is zero. But when you look at what he sees to the south, you know, he can see. So that means that all those paragliders flying out towards sky surface, if he gets them as a ping, they're then converted into pilot aware language. So people who receive those broadcasts know that they're there. So like I say, it might, I've not flown in Switzerland with a clever enough instrument, but it'd be interesting to see what the various instruments show on uh, Bernie's network in Switzerland. So just quickly looking at some of the technology, although I'm not sure Jürgen is still making them. This is a Skytrax 3. Flam Fanit antenna. You need various little bits of clever technology. Now, one of them is for the remote. And one of them is for wireless, I think. That's the remote. So you can configure that to do things, which is useful because it means that you can fly along with your hands in your brakes or on your rear risers waiting for the big collapse. And you can be looking at the instrument and pressing the button and the instrument's changing. You're not taking your hand out the brakes and then you get a 60% collapse on this side that you need to deal with on that side. So, you know, there is quite some clever stuff there. The Wi-Fi dongle is useful because then it, it will put it on the internet and that's how you can receive OGN information. Right, what else is there? Ah, so this is the, be the Skytrax beacon that they no longer make, which is a great shame. It was under 200 quid. The battery lasts 25 hours. Once you've actually plugged it into your computer and edited the text file the first time you, you use it after you buy it, literally you just turn it on. So... Once a year, you have to update the Flam license. But other than that, literally, you charge it up, you switch it on, you fly. And the great thing about it is it records flight logs as IGC. So when your normal Vario's let you down, you could probably go into the comp organisers. You know, your tracker's not been working. It's been out of coverage or the battery's gone flat. Your normal instruments let you down. There's an IGC file in there for the day. <coughs> so you can just grab that out and off you go. So what other technologies have we got for EC? The obvious one, if you've ever flown in, if you've flown in competitions recently, is the, the Flymaster trackers. So basically in there, it's a mobile phone. And the mobile phone just literally transmits. It's got very, very simple controls on it. So you know, normally they turn it on, that's for SOS. There'll be a combination on the side that you press to tell them you landed. And then they take it back from you at the end of the day and clear it. So, Flymaster lend these to Ulrich for the PwC. I think Ulrich's got somewhere between 150 and 180 of those. Obviously, when he's testing them, he only tests them in small batches. Otherwise, the little mobile phone mast near his house dies. Um, Brett Janaway runs Air Tribune. He's bought Air Tribune now. He owns Air Tribune. They use the trackers and they do a lot of competitions with them. So, um, but there's nothing really to see there. You get handed them in a comp, you fly with it, you check in when you've landed, you give it back to them at the end of the day. So 
with these, if you register these or any of your other devices on the various places on the internet, that allows you access to live tracking. So, um, Indy has made an application called XC Guide, which is very good at all the tracking protocols. So, if his program is told your username and your login on um, any of the live tracking sites, he can put that in or you can put that into the app and then you can see that person. So if you haven't looked at this, it's very, very well worth looking at. Not only has it got a huge amount of live tracking in it, there's all the necessary stuff you need for flying with airspace and so on and so forth. Uh, it's free and because he's retired, he just develops it because he wants to. Um, and because of that, he's also done a lot of fiddling with a lot of the hardware devices to try and chuck out Flam and Fanit. So, um, I think he might have a blog somewhere, but again, he's a man worth following. Um, and I can check out the app. I think there might be something in this that tells you where the release list is and stuff. Right. So, trackers in competitions we'll just quickly run through that air tribune is one lot fly master another lot you set them up at the um, base so somebody like Ulrich or um a brett's guy whose name i forget they'll get however many trackers they are they load them with a sim card they make sure the sim card's got credit on it or a subscription and then they configure them all and they hand them out in the competition they can therefore track every competitor they can see if anything goes wrong. The scoring is live. And there's somebody who's scored before. You're not waiting for them all to come in. And then they stand in a queue. And that particular GPS unit you haven't got the plug for. Basically, unless something goes wrong, all the tracking is live. So the person lands. They sign in. They've landed. They get retrieved. By the time they hand the tracker back to the competition organising people, you know, the scoring people, unless something's gone badly wrong, the track log's already in the thing. I mean, they tell you your score and off you go. So the tracker being, normally what they do is that the tracker not only sends a blip, but it will record a backup IGC file. So if they lost your tracker, they can then stick the tracker on a cable and download the IGC. So you've already got the tracker live plus a backup, plus hopefully your own instrument. The tracker being handed in is actually only a final safety check. So at the end of the day, you count all the trackers up and you know that not every, only has everybody safely come back from their XC, but they've actually been to the retreat to the comp headquarters and handed you something. So there's lots of levels of safety. Um, there's the tracker itself, there's a tracker signed in as you've safely landed. The person in the retrieve bus has put um, your uh, number into their app. Because the other thing is that with Indy's app, you can be a pilot on his app or you can be the retrieve bus. And if you're the retrieve bus, you get a different level of information. So when um, Steve Ham first started using live tracking, the retrieve bus driver didn't get much information except the location of the pilot and whether the app thought the pilot was flying or on the ground. And normally, you know, there's two indicators for on the ground. You're moving very, very slowly and your altitude is the same as ground level. So that's how that all works. Once you've done the reporting in procedure, then there's the retrieval system. And in really, for hang gliding and paradigm, it gives you unrivaled management of incidents. Because if somebody threw their reserve, they'd probably be descending at between four and a half and five and a half metres a second. You've got a filter for that. So that person coming straight down in the same place, your software's detected that. So before they hit the ground, you know you've got something to deal with. You know, you can then, there will be a private comp safety frequency. So on that frequency, the match, the um, meathead can start calling certain pilots. So on that safety frequency, have you seen this incident? What's going on? They can give reports back. And then straight away, you know, you can see roughly where everybody is. If the, if the majority of pilots were here, there was an incident here and you could see some weather here and the goal was there the task's going to be cancelled. It's very, very straightforward. And that's why it's given us a lot of um, 
extra safety. So there's other EC devices. We're now very near the end. These are more for general use for any sort of thing. You've got you know, personal locator beacon, spot, Garmin in reach. Some of these use satcoms, so they're very, very useful if you're out of mobile phone coverage. Because they use satellite phone technology, some of them are wickedly expensive. You can also set them up so that they will ping your location every so often. So again, it's another form of electronic conspicuity. Most of them have got some form of SOS button. So if you if you crash somewhere and you're still compartmented enough to hit that, that will then trigger a whole chain of events. You know, people on known phone numbers will be notified. Your location is then visible to the people who have the right to see that. The organisation who are running the, the emergency that that triggers, you know, you might have an insurance poly or something connected. They can then see. Right. So we've looked at all these amazing systems. We're just going to round up by looking at some of the problems. We've got all these clever systems. They don't talk to each other. Most of them aren't interoperable. You know, the other problem we've got, and some RAF stations are doing unofficial, well, in fact, official um, trial of unofficial systems, but the uncertified solutions are not allowed in certified areas. So if you're running an ATC at an RAF station, officially you can't look at pilot aware and definitely not at flight radar 24. I mean pilot aware has no delay on it but flight radar 24 will have a big layer. So you can't look at uncertified sources of information. Now obviously in certain areas the RAF are saying well you know no we won't use it for air traffic control but if we had one of these 300 pound pilot aware ground stations and it started telling us about a load of gliders, we wouldn't use it to say avoid glider X location Y, but we could say to people, oh, if you're headed over towards so and so, that airfield's operating and there's thousands of gliders up. Cloud base is obviously 5,200 foot because there's loads of them at 5,150. So they have now started changing. The other thing with uncertified is uncertified is allowed to receive certified, but it can't transmit the other way. So if I've got a pilot aware, I'm allowed to receive ADSB in. I can't transmit ADSB out because they're not certified for that. And the, the other thing is that so if we're power pilots, we can access the uncertified glider networks. But it's not so easy for the uncertified glider networks to access the more certified stuff. And the hardest stuff is that most of GA is using transponders and they don't transmit a location. So even if there was a clever way of us all receiving transponders, it wouldn't help because all we know that there was a transponder aircraft nearby. We wouldn't know where it was. Now we start to look at who's trying to do some level of interoperability. So we look at the OGN. So the Open Glider Network is Europe wide. These are all ground stations. All pilot aware ground stations also contribute to the OGN. So um, they downlink FLAM and the OGN protocol. They put it on the internet and they generally spread, spread it around. So if we look at our patch, and this will be a bit more useful, since I took this screen dump, there have a bit more gone up, but um, there's one at Chalock, which wasn't up at the time I took this screen dump, that's mine. There's one down near Folkestone now. Here, we've got the one at Deanland, and I think that's Palmer's. I'm not sure what that one is. Not all of these do rebroadcast, but I know that those two do. So they will downlink FLAM and tell people on Pilot Aware that there's gliders around. So now I've got a little bit more. I've put all this into words. So if it's a Pilot Aware OGNR type station, it can downlink Mode S transponders. So the thing with the whole mode S transponders and lack of location is we can do some clever maths. So if I downlink a mode S transponder with a timestamp on it, 
and various other people downlink the same mode S tra transponder with the timestamp, we don't all receive that transmission at the same time. And because we've all received a timestamp packet at very slightly different times, and you do need accurate timing for this, you need to be on um, NTP or better. Because we've all received a timestamp packet at slightly different times, we can work out the delay and therefore the distance. If we've got five or six places all telling a distance to something, if we just draw circles with mass, we can tell where the aircraft is. So that's called multilateration, and that's how Pilot Aware can work out where an aircraft is, even if it doesn't tell you its location. So um, we're downlinking FLAM as well, and then we're telling light aircraft about that. We're contributing FLAM and ADSB to the 360 radar network, which then gives people a big pseudo radar display. And we contribute FLAM to the OGN servers. We also downlink OGN trackers, but I've never seen an OGN tracker. They exist and you can build them, but never seen or heard of one. So it's all kind of a little bit confusing and I'm wondering if this graphic is going to help. So basically the blue blocks are the different types of technology and how they work. So for instance, ATC, receives information from secondary surveillance radar and then it radios the pilot in charge and tells him what to do. A transponder in that mode will talk to secondary surveillance radar. A transponder in mode S will talk to clever mass and via clever mass we might get a location for pilot aware. If we haven't got the clever mass we might just get a warning that it's somewhere nearby best with transponders is that they've got extended squitter and then they turn themselves into a, a ADSB. This is just generally the way they work. So anything with the gold arrow is bi-directional communication, which is what you want. The grey or silver is one way. What is extended squitter? So extended squitter is a protocol that's sited on top of the 1090 broadcasts that the transponders make to back to secondary surveillance radar. <laughs> so, okay, so basically what happens is that you only know where a transponder is because a radar thing has pinged it and said, oi. So it's pinged it, it's had the echo back. But it's, the, it's on a relay station. Really. So... Uh, so you've, you've had the ping and the, the response, you've had the ping and the echo, and that doesn't tell you anything except there's something there. But the transponder has now woken up and said, I am a this at this altitude with this squawk code. So now SSR knows where it is. When you add in the extended squitter, it will ping without being asked. So now, rather than waiting for secondary surveillance radar, because if there is no secondary surveillance radar, hello chocolate teapot with the extended squitter it's now not waiting for secondary surveillance radar every so often it's going i am this registration aircraft at this altitude with this squawk code so suddenly now a whole range of devices aren't waiting for that because the problem with secondary surveillance radar is there's not a lot of, a lot of it below a, a 1500 foot or a thousand foot so without secondary surveillance radar Hello chocolate teapot. When we put the extended squitter protocol on, suddenly it's not waiting, it's saying, hello, I am a this and this is my location. So now all these other technologies, all the ADSB, all the pilot aware people, they can now see this transponder without waiting for anything. And they're not doing clever math. When they receive the transmission from that transponder, they can go, you are a so-and-so type of aircraft at this altitude with this squawk code, you are there. So that really is the useful bit of transponders for us and for pilot aware, because you don't need a ground station, you don't need anything, you just need something that's capable of receiving the ADSB. And again, that's not that much help to us because we're really flying with flam and we're slow moving, you know. The hedgehog doesn't run around the car that's trying to run it over. The car sees the hedgehog and avoids it. So this again, it comes back to the purpose, doesn't it? You know, 
The cyclists have got the, you know, if a car is chasing a cyclist to run them over, the cyclist is never going to escape. So you've got the high-vis jacket on, the car driver sees you, they can easily steer around you. That's why we are chucking out, and it should be in the next slide. So now we're looking at, so pilot aware to pilot aware, it's a bi-directional thing. Fanit and Flam going via our ground station, yes. Modes transponder via our clever mass, yes. ADSB, yes. So this in a way is very, very good at seeing everybody else. It's not brilliant at telling everybody else where it is, but by the very nature of an, a light aircraft, a light aircraft should be staying out of the way of commercial air transport with ADSB. The Modes transponder, well, that's potluck. Flam and Fanit, you'd like to think that people flying light aircraft, because they've got power, you know, if I'm, to if I'm tootling back from the Isle of Wight and I get a load of verbal in my ears about people flying at West Fur, I just think, right, that's fine. If it's sea breeze, I'll go on the sea breeze side because you won't catch me at three and a half grand, 2K the other side, the sea breeze. Or if I'm prepared to be really careful because... You might still be thermaling there, but it's sea breezed on the ground and people are flying off Cabern and there's an airstrip 3K that way, isn't there, at Kitty Hawk. So all this stuff is dead useful. So I'd see paragliders and hang gliders and I'd just steer around them because they shouldn't have to leave us thermal to steer around me. In fact, I was flying into Kitty Hawk once and I saw somebody on some sort of red ozone at about two and a half grand climbing right in the middle of the circuit, the one place you shouldn't really be. But I was thinking, well, I can see people at Cabern, this is downwind of Cabern, all, you know. He had no EC, but I thought, well, there's probably going to be people about, and lo and behold, they were. But the problem is, and this is a real problem, and why this, it's a shame that this isn't more interoperable, Every branch of aviation seems to think they are the best and everybody else is a tosser. And if you go to, into some branch, you know, paragliding and hang gliding, people are pretty open-minded, but if you go and talk to some GA pilots, you know, they seem to think that everything revolves around them except commercial air transport because that's what some of them are aspiring to. But if you, if you go and talk even to sailplane pilots, they think that hang gliding and pilot paragliding are only ridge soaring. And you say, well, you know, the paragliding record in the UK is over 300k. How did they do that without an engine? Well, you need to go away and think about that. So it's not, but there is a lot of, there's quite a lot of blinkers on you tend to find. Right, let's look at interoperability for Flam, then we're done. So Flam to Flam is great. Very simple, works in both directions. Flam works to pilot aware, but not the other way around. Some sailplane pilots and some FLAM equipment has an ADSB receiver, so it goes that way. If you buy a very expensive ADSB transmitter, it goes the other way, but most people don't. You know, a sailplane will carry FLAM. If they're going to carry a second piece of EC, it'll be a transponder. And then with FANIT, FANIT works to FLAM. Because if we're carrying Fanit Plus, we've got a Flam tr transmitter, therefore a Flam sailplane can receive us. Going back the other way, we can only do it via the OGN, and there's a big latency problem there. So it's a kind of a bit of um, a dog's breakfast. And in the end, it's useful to have these things, but you've just got to look where the hell you're going. <laughs> Right, very quickly, we should do a few questions, and then you were saying, did you have a question about technology and what people should... Oh, yeah, so question about what low airtime pilots should buy. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed because the, um, the EC rebate has ended, or it will end in a few days' time. Um, there aren't really any easy, simple solutions unless you start looking at the, the home-built stuff. However, now, ah, there is a rumour that in the next 12 months, something will come on the market from an unexpected source, 
but unfortunately it's covered by an NDA. So, you know, I would say that if you missed the rebate, unless you really, really need something this season, you might sit on your hands for a little bit. Uh, she'll be on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to just, um, I'm going to try and clip it up and upload it tonight from home. Because if I if I do it from here, you'll, I'll still be here when they turn up tomorrow evening. Um, and then I'll talk to Matey about where I leave the file for him to upload to the SHGC one. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I about the kit being used overseas, so we could use I've got a Skytrax. Could I use that in Europe? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Skytrax is fine in Europe. There's no problem with using the Skytrax in Europe. Um, most Flam stuff should work in Europe. Fanit stuff should work in Europe. It's really a question of where the boundaries are for the ISM bands, because in the States they have allocated different bands for that, and therefore, you know, you just you can't. The other problem is because the the stuff we're using has been done down to a budget, the chances of it being dual frequency are non-existent. So, you know, there's a load of talk. The CIA are talking about a unified EC type policy. But what they mean is that they want every, they wanted everybody to go on to ADSB. And because ADSB is partly an old technology, you don't need a lot of old technology using frequencies inefficiency for the f frequency to get flooded. So, oh yeah, well, we'll just do it all on ADSB. And then somebody said, you do realise the Americans have said that they won't allow drones on ADSB because it's almost full and it will get full if if every Tom Dick and drone buys an ADSB transponder and starts transponding ADSB, it'll grind to a halt. And it's a bit like a mobile phone. Once the cell is full, nothing else can get on. So they then change their minds. The Americans are going to use a second. So the Americans are going to keep the main frequency for ADSB, and then there'll be a secondary frequency for drones and other stuff that's not quite so mainstream. So now the CIA are talking. Oh yeah, we'll do that. We'll use another. We'll use nine seven eight megahertz for UAT or FI. Um, FISB or TISB, FISB is Flight Information Service Broadcast and TISB is Traffic Information Service Broadcast. And it'll all work like this and it'll all work like that. And, you know, there are people popping up saying, well, you do realise the frequency you want to use is at the moment allocated to other things. Oh, oh OK, well, we'll try and fly up there. And you do realise that nobody's making any of this kit except the Americans to work on this frequency. And you do realise, but they're still, they're ploughing ahead with their, this is the future of EC. And we're reminded about 25 years ago, they were telling us all that we should carry transponders and that would sort everything out. And then you say, well, a transponder is a 130 watt or a 260 watt device. How long does that last with a tiny battery on a paraglider? You know, a, the CIA, yeah. Yeah. But, sorry. Yes. It's 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 image recognition and AI. So in theory, they'd see everything from large, you know, visual. yeah, vis visual, but also augmented by EC. But I think part see the problem is the drone posse talk a lot, and they want the drone posse came up with some fantastic thing that they wanted EC to be completely mandatory in the UK by 2025. And you say, well, what sort of EC are you putting your hands in your pockets to pay for it? Because we don't need it. You need it in order to fly this stuff here, there and everywhere. So if it's such a profitable industry, can you put your hands in your pockets? And then there's a stunned silence. You know, and the thing is that if drones suddenly had to start carrying, if, if the processing had to be done, done on the drone and they had to carry a load of extra stuff, it wouldn't get off the ground, the smaller ones. Smaller, you know, the bigger ones are flying NHS stuff around. No, it wouldn't make that much difference. But... Suddenly they've got to carry all this stuff. What sort of technology are they using? You know, if they're using 
ADSB and FLAM and pilot aware, let's say for want of argument, what do they do about transponders? Well, yeah. Who are the corporate commercial drivers of this, the principal ones? Oh, people like Bristow Helicopters, the people who drive, because I'm doing a little bit for the BMA, trying to deal with all these airspace change proposals, and they're all written by people who are um, pushing to have their drone here, their drone there. Right. And I'm, I haven't seen any Amazon-based proposals. Most of the proposals at the moment are from people like Bristow. So Bristow have a large drone that's looking for migrant boats in the channel. That's a big thing of me. Um, there's another lo lot who are looking to do stuff to the highlands and islands, and they want to have a huge area to test. And someone's saying, well, actually, there's already a load of controlled airspace that's been closed to us so that you can t test drones in North Wales. Why are you putting in airspace change? Special purpose stuff at the moment. Yes, yeah. So um, I'm trying to think. The main one I'm concerned with, or that I've been chasing, is the Bristow one. And there have been various other people. They come up with the, uh, these ideas, and then you say, well, you know, the CIA wanted to be balanced for all airspace users. And when you start putting all these things like, well, you know, if you close this airspace every day for five days a week, that's not proportionate. And where, where and when are you flying? Well, we just need to, and you say, no, no, no. What we want is we want a danger area crossing service and we want a danger area information service. So that means that when you're not flying or you're flying, we can ring a number and we can be told, drone on the ground, drone in flying today, fill your boots. That doesn't cost a lot of money. As soon as you then turn around and say, well, this is a huge area and the drone can't be flying at Lydon and at Manston at the same time. So wherever it's flying in that area, somebody in a light aircraft should be able to call up and say, if the drone's at Lydon and it can't get to where you are within the next hour and you need 20 minutes to cross the airspace, you want to be able to call up ATC and say, where's the drone? Can I cross? The problem is suddenly now that costs a lot of money to provide. And you look at a lot of the proposals and, oh, yeah, we're providing information service. Yeah, but what about for light aircraft, the crossing service? So that somebody can ring up and, you know, maybe it might be that people want to launch from the White Cliffs of Drover. We want to just do a top to bottom on the beach, but we'd have to fly through your airspace. Where's the drone? Oh, the drone's down at Lid and it won't be up your way for two hours. Right, we'll fly through and we'll call you in half an hour to say we're all landed. That costs money to provide. The minute you start saying to the drone people, by the way, can we do this? Or by the way, can we do that? Suddenly there's all, oh, all, oh, you know, and then they go away and they want to reformulate their, um, they want to reformulate their bid.